The job of the rate limiter is to decide if a request will be served or declined. If the request is accepted, then it will be passed to the API servers. In most cases, a rate limiter is used as a defensive mechanism. It protects your services from overuse or from malicious users. It relies on some rules to decide when to limit the traffic. For instance, it can limit the number of requests a user can make in a given period of time. If this limit is exceeded, the user or IP needs to be throttled. This means that any further request that is made to the API by that user will fail or will be added to a queue to be processed later. Without this mechanism, any user can blast your server with requests, leading to high latencies or even unavailable services. Large-scale applications, they're all using some kind of rate limiter on the API as a safeguard tool. So, it's no wonder that designing an API rate limiter is a popular question in many software design interviews. Imagine that you created a beautiful service that allows users to find the cheapest flight for any destination and you expose it to the large public. As your service gets traction, you're also facing some issues. First, you notice that the user is bombarding your service with requests that look unusual. After further investigation, you find out that this user is actually an automated script that is trying to do a denial of service attack. You block this user and you're wondering if there is a better way to detect this kind of attacks automatically in the future. Then, as the service gets popular, it attracts more and more visitors. At this point, you can't probably provide the service for free, as a lot of hardware resources are necessary. So, you're thinking about a pay-per-use model. You still want to allow a certain number of requests for free per user, but after a certain threshold is passed, it would make sense to create a premium tier. So, how could we implement a cost management solution while solving the security problems at the same time? The answer to both problems and others, as we'll see next, is a rate limiting system. As always, we should have a plan of action. First, we need to establish the requirements of the system and define what we want to achieve. During an interview, it's critical to ask questions in order to clarify the functional needs, the scope of the system, and also the non-functional requirements. As we'll see, there are multiple ways and algorithms to build a rate limiter, and each implementation has some strengths and some weaknesses. This is why it's essential to know what we want to achieve in the beginning. Also, in the interview, it won't be possible to cover all the topics. The conversation will lead into some specific part or another. However, in this video, we'll cover essentially all the aspects of a rate limiter. For the rate limiter, the functional requirements seem straightforward. We limit the number of calls that an entity can make to an API within a given time frame. For example, only two requests per second allowed, or only 10 accounts per day allowed. However, here, it's also important to establish how we communicate to the clients that their requests are being throttled and how we display the status of the system. Next, the more puzzling part is the non-functional requirements. First, we might ask what kind of rate limiter are we building? Is it on client side or on the server side? Here, we might discuss the trade-offs of each implementation. We'll discuss this later in more detail. Then, we need to know if we should design a local rate limiter or one that is distributed on multiple nodes. So, a good question to the interviewer is if high availability is required for the system. In case of non-availability, the system will be prone to attacks. So, if it's required, then we might discuss what pitfalls we might encounter in such a system. Other requirements can be related to performance. When we add a rate limiter, we should be careful not to add substantial latency to the request. The user experience should not suffer. Other requirements might be related to cost efficiency. For instance, to use as little memory as possible. 
There are three kinds of rate limiting based on where we place them. We have client-side rate limiting. However, when the implementation is placed on the client, it's fairly easy to change it and modify its behavior. Therefore, it's unreliable to enforce the rate limiting system on the client. Then, we can place the rate limiter on the servers that also contain the application that we provide. In general, this is a better approach. Furthermore, if we have a microservice architecture, then it's more natural to have the rate limiter as a separate service that sits between the clients and the services. Here, it's most common to place the rate limiter within an API gateway service that also provides other functions like authentication, load balancing, or enforce security policies. Where shall we store the counters needed for rate limiting? Since one non-functional requirement of the rate limiter is to be blazing fast, we have to be careful about storing and retrieving data. We don't want to add up a lot of time for each request. Therefore, storing counters in a traditional persistent database like MySQL is not the best option. The time it takes to access the disk is pretty high for a rate limiter. For instance, if we're using a persistent database to store the counts, we might expect to process one request per millisecond. This means we can reach a throughput of 1000 requests per second. However, if we use an in-memory cache like Redis, we might process a request in 100 nanoseconds. This will result in a throughput of around 10 million requests per second, which is indeed a big difference. Leaking bucket algorithm is very simple and elegant. It's widely used in computer networks and it's also the default rate limiter for the Nginx web server. Here, the analogy is with a bucket where water is poured in at the top and water also leaks from the bottom. If the rate of pouring water exceeds the rate of water leaking, then the bucket will overflow. This simple engineer concept will smooth out traffic and it will allow requests to pass only at a constant rate. Basically, the bucket is a queue where requests wait to be processed according to a first-in, first-out scheduling algorithm. When a request arrives, the system checks if the queue is not full before adding it. At regular intervals, requests are being pulled from the queue and processed. If the queue is already full, then new requests will be dropped. This algorithm takes two parameters. Bucket size. This parameter defines the number of maximum requests that can wait in the queue. Then, the process rate parameter specifies how many requests can be treated at a fixed rate, usually in seconds. Let's see what are the pros and cons of this algorithm. First, it's memory efficient given the limited queue size. Then, this algorithm is suitable for use cases when a stable processing rate is necessary. But, if the queue is full with old requests that are not processed in time, then new requests will be rate limited. Also, the two parameters, process rate and bucket size, are not always easy to adjust properly. The token bucket algorithm is similar to the leaky bucket algorithm, but because it uses tokens, it can process some bursts of requests. In contrast, leaky bucket algorithm always process requests at a constant rate. This is not good or bad. It will depend on what are the needs. Amazon Elastic Cloud and Amazon API Gateway both are using this algorithm to throttle their API requests. Let's see how it works. As the name suggests, we have a token bucket or a container that has a predefined capacity. Then, we add tokens into the bucket at periodic moments of time. This bucket can store tokens until it gets full. If extra tokens are added, they will overflow. Then, when some requests come, they will consume one token each. If there are tokens in the bucket, then the request will be processed. If the bucket is empty, then new requests will be dropped. So, this algorithm will take two parameters. The bucket size, which represents 
the maximum number of tokens allowed in the bucket, and the refill rate, which is the number of tokens put into the bucket periodically. How many buckets do we need? This will depend on our rate limiting rules. It's usually necessary to have different buckets for different API endpoints. For instance, if a user is allowed to make 3 accounts per day, add 5 articles per hour, and comment 50 times per hour, then 3 buckets are required for each user. Let's see which are the pros and cons of this algorithm. Tiny memory usage, since we have only 2 numbers per counter. Then, as mentioned, this algorithm allows bursts of traffic for short periods. The burst size will depend on the number of tokens available. However, the two parameters, refill rate and bucket size, are not always easy to adjust properly. Fixed window algorithm is one of the most basic rate limiting mechanisms. How does it work? This algorithm divides the timeline into fixed size windows. Then, we assign the same capacity for each window. For example, we can allow maximum 4 requests per second. When a request will come, it will increment the counter by 1. This algorithm will accept requests until the capacity is reached for the given time window. Further requests will be dropped until a new window starts. However, this algorithm has a major flow. Let's zoom in on the timeline. Now, if 4 requests are coming in the last half of a second, and another 4 requests will come in the first half of the next second, then this algorithm will accept them. However, in this time interval of 1 second, 8 requests were allowed. That's twice the allowed capacity for a time window. Now let's see what are the pros and cons. This algorithm is easy to implement. Also, it has a small memory footprint because all that is being done is storing the counts. However, it's not accurate. It can permit more requests to go through than the configure quota. The natural thing to do to improve the fixed size window algorithm is to use a sliding window. Again, we configure the rate limiter to allow a maximum of 4 requests per second. Now, let's consider that in the current window of a second, there are already 2 requests, and in the previous window, we had 1 request. Let's say a new request comes in at a 50% position in the current window. But now, we'll have to consider a sliding window of a second that ends just at the new request timestamp. Therefore, the number of requests in the rolling window is calculated using the following formula. Number of requests in the current window, 3, plus the number of requests in the previous window, 1, multiplied with the overlap percentage between the rolling window and the previous window, which is 50%. Using this formula, we get 3.5 requests for the sliding window. In this case, we get a decimal result which we can round up if we want to be more rigid or we can round it down to allow one more request per window. So, since the rate limiter allows a maximum of 4 requests per second, the last request can go through. But there is more. This algorithm assumes a constant rate of requests during the previous sampling period. For instance, it was assumed a constant rate of 1 for the previous second. But what if that one request happened in the first part of the second? Then a more accurate result of the sliding window would have been 3. The algorithm can be improved, but in practice, the simple formula that we used proves to be good enough for most cases. A slightly improved version of this is used at Cloudflare to handle efficiently billions of requests per day. Let's see what are the pros and cons of this algorithm. Sliding window approach solves the accuracy problem of the fixed window implementation. Also, this algorithm is nice on resources since it has a small memory footprint. And it also avoids the starvation problem that the leaky bucket algorithm has. However, it doesn't calculate an exact rate for the sliding window. It assumes that the requests in the previous window are evenly distributed. However, as mentioned, the difference in the actual result is so small that it's negligible. 
The algorithm of the sliding window log fixes the issue of perfect accuracy. In this algorithm, we use a log or a register, and we define the capacity as the number of allowed entries in the log per time frame. Let's say that the rate limiter allows two requests per second. When a request comes in, the first thing the algorithm does is to remove outdated timestamps. Outdated timestamps means those older than the current time window, in this case, older than one second. Here, we have nothing to remove yet. The second thing the algorithm does is to add the timestamp of the request to the log. When the request arrives, the log is empty. Therefore, the request is allowed to pass. Then, 100 milliseconds later, a new request arrives. We have no timestamp to remove yet. Then, the new timestamp is inserted into the log. After the insertion, the log size is 2, not larger than the allowed count. Thus, the request is allowed. Then, another request arrives 100 milliseconds later. All timestamps are no older than 1 second, so there is still nothing to remove. After the insertion, the log size becomes 3, larger than the allowed size of 2, and therefore, this request is rejected, even though the timestamp remains in the log. Finally, a request arrives 900 milliseconds later. If we look at the time, the last two requests are in the range of the last one second, but the previous requests are outdated. So, the first two outdated timestamps are removed from the log. Then, the new timestamp is inserted into the log. After the remove operation, the log size becomes 2, and therefore, the request is accepted. Now, let's see what are the pros and cons of this algorithm. First, a rate limiter implemented with this algorithm is very accurate. In any rolling window, requests will not exceed the rate limit. Also, this implementation avoids the starvation problem of the leaky bucket. However, this algorithm is not memory efficient. It eats a lot of memory. Even in the case when the request is rejected, its timestamp is still stored in memory. Even though we didn't get really deep into the algorithm implementations, it helped to understand them at a high level in order to choose the right one for the right use case. As we saw, each algorithm has its pros and cons. However, two algorithms stood out in all categories. The token bucket algorithm is good all around, but it needs strong transactional support when high concurrency is needed. However, sliding window counter offers the same benefits, although it requires a basic transactional support for high concurrency. Now, it would be great if the system would allow to configure different rate limiting rules for different use cases. For example, one rule might be to limit the number of accounts a user can create to 5 per day. Then, with another rule, we might limit a user to create no more than 5 posts per hour. First, where do we store these rules? Since we probably want to change the rule often, it would make sense to define them outside the code. A good option is to save these rules on a configuration file like YAML and save it on disk. Here we have an example of the previous rules. Furthermore, for fast access, we can put these rules in a cache and write them back to disk only at periodic intervals of time. Traditionally, web applications respond with status code 4 to 9 to many requests if the rate limit is surpassed. For other use cases, for instance, when the system is overloaded, we might add the extra call to a queue, like Kafka, so that we could process the request later. In this case, we might respond with a status code 202 accepted. Furthermore, to communicate better the status of the rate limiter, we can add more than just the HTTP status code. For example, for rate limiting, Twitter and GitHub 
are both using the following HTTP headers in the response. For different resources, they're using at least the following three headers. In the limit header, we can let the client know how many calls he can make per time window. In the remaining header, we can put information about the remaining number of allowed requests within the time window. And the reset header shows the timestamp of the current time window. In an environment where we have high concurrency, we almost always encounter race conditions. In general, a rate limiter does two things for each request. First, it checks the current counter value to see if the request can be served. Second, it increments the counter by one and writes the value back into memory. Now, let's consider that two requests read the counter at about the same time. They both read the same value, let's say it's 4. Then, they both increase the value read with 1. And finally, they try to write back the new value. However, these two independent requests don't know about each other without synchronization. In this case, both threads believe they write back the correct counter with value 5, but the correct value of the counter should be 6. One strategy to solve this problem is to use locks. We lock on a certain resource while it's being used by another request. Then, we wait until the lock is released for that resource. However, this kind of synchronization may create blocking situations which might slow down the system. Therefore, when using locks, we have to be careful to reduce the area that needs synchronization. If we want to scale the rate limiter system to millions of users, we need to spin up more than one rate limiter server to handle the traffic. Now, if a certain user sends multiple requests, then each request might land on a different server. But this will lead to multiple counters per user, which makes the rate limiter almost useless. So, when multiple servers are used for a rate limiter, we need to enforce some kind of synchronization between them. One solution for this problem is to use sticky sessions. In this case, each client will always send traffic to a specific server. However, this option is not flexible enough to be fault tolerant. This means that if a rate limiter node crashes, then some users won't be served by the system. Sticky session solution is also not flexible enough to allow a system to scale. It would be a pain to add or remove servers in such an environment. But both characteristics, scalability and fault tolerance, are critical in modern distributed systems, so we must find a better way. Another option is to use centralized data stores to handle counts for all consumers. We can choose Redis or Cassandra because they are already scalable out of the box. In a nutshell, a rate limiting implementation is a traffic control mechanism. It has rules and policies set by the API operator or owner to make sure that the service has constant performance and always on availability. This should be valid even when the service is hit by high spikes in the number of requests. Therefore, a rate limiter is a good addition for both security and quality control.